Good morning. Psalm 42.5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Sometimes you have a week like that, right? Sometimes David got a little bit discouraged. But I want you to notice what he says next, and it's the same verse. He says, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Today, no matter what you've been going through, let's put our hope in God. Let's declare, I'm going to praise him. And it says, for the help of his countenance. His countenance is going to shine upon us. And it's interesting, the last verse says the same thing, but it ends slightly different. It says, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. And when you put those two together, his countenance becomes our countenance. Let's put our hope in God. Let's give him some praise today.
because I've had so many questions about what's going on in my face. <laughs> so I had some spots that were pre-cancer and they went and they said these two were real bad, but they took care of it and they Amen. checked everything out, my Amen. arms everywhere, my back everywhere, no cancer. Hallelujah. Praise God, right? So it looks a little rough. Mark didn't hit me or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go.
The Lord gave me this word, write these words down and give them to my church, says the Lord. The freedom you once had to share the truth about the things of God, salvation in Jesus Christ will be put to the test. Those who choose to speak up courageously will be persecuted severely. Do not be afraid to speak the words I give you. The words I give you are life-giving to those who do not know me. No amount of threats of persecution can stop you, for I am with you and protect you. Do not love the things of this world that draw you away from me. They will be taken from you to punish you because you are speaking my truth, says the Lord. Be bold and loving in all that you do, having no fear of punishment or persecution for doing that which I have called you to say and do. Keep speaking the truth. Keep loving those who hate you and persecute you for my name. Many of the lost will come to me during these great times of persecution. Therefore, do not be given over to fear, but everyone who believes in me continue to do all that I have called you to do. The greater the persecution is of the church, the greater my grace is given to you, the body of Christ. They need their moms or a dad up here with them in the front, please. Thank you.
you are great, oh Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. We're going to go into some prayer. Want to lift up Yvonne Townsell. She has, is in the hospital with uh, really a few things, some heart issues, some uh, lung issues. We're going to pray for her. But also right before service, I got this text that Jen Johnstone fell down the stairs yesterday and broke her neck. Had surgery last night, is doing well. Doctors are happy with her progress already, but she still has very limited movement in three of her limbs. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we lift up Jen right now. We thank you, God, that even though she took this terrible fall, we thank you, God, you are with her. We thank you, God, that the surgery went well. And Lord, we just speak life into every limb. We speak life into every limb. God, we pray that she will fully recover in the name of Jesus. Oh, we thank you, God, for the care she's getting now. And we just pray that even the doctors will be amazed at the progress. So we speak life to every limb, every nerve, every muscle. Let her be encouraged and even feel our prayers right now. Oh, fill that room, oh God. Fill that room with your healing power. And we lift up Yvonne as well. We thank you, God. You are with her. You are with her. And we just pray, God, for you to bless her. We pray for health. We pray for healing. And Lord, as the family makes decisions as to what's going to be best moving forward, we ask for your wisdom, your direction. And Lord, as we pray, no doubt there are other needs represented here today. And I just lift up every need represented here today. Lord, we pray for ongoing healing of sick bodies. Lord, we pray for ongoing direction where decisions are being made. We pray for breakthrough, Lord, where there's a need for breakthrough. We pray for provision where there is a need for provision. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings that rest upon your people. We thank you, God, that you are with us and nothing is too hard for you. Oh, we are so thankful for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Greet some people around you. Give somebody some encouragement. Those online, we welcome you and uh, type in a word of greeting. We would love to hear from you today as well. You may be seated. As you're being seated again, welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to Jubilee. And any of you who may be guests today, welcome to the Jubilee family. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. If you are a guest here today, we'd love to get to know you better. There's a welcome card there in the backs of the chairs. If you'd grab one, fill it out, drop it in the offering basket or at the kiosk in the back on your way out, and we have a gift for you for worshiping with us today, and we're going to be praying for you to have a blessed week. If you will grab your bulletin, just going to highlight a couple of things. There is a weight loss support group starts this afternoon, 3 o'clock, and it is a Zoom meeting. And Julie, wave your hand, Julie. If you are not on the list and you would like to, you know, make that link, talk to Julie after. She'll give you the connection. So that starts today, support group for weight loss 330. Then we've extended our T-shirt sales. If you still wanted to get a Jubilee T-shirt, you have to order it by tomorrow. Tomorrow. 
And then Celebrate Minnesota is coming. It's a, an outreach. There's a website there if you want to volunteer for something. And there's a training tomorrow night. The details are there you can sign up for. But um, we have a really brief video where the evangelist who's coming is going to bring us a greeting. So let's hear that. Hey, Jubilee Worship Center, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. You have no idea how much we appreciate you, so thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing with us and for us. We're just so grateful for your prayer. Listen, if it wasn't for you praying, none of this would happen. So thank you for being so committed and dedicated to praying. For all the people that have volunteered, and we need more, we need more volunteers. Thank you for the people that you're sharing with us to be able to see this wonderful opportunity come to Central Minnesota. You see, your partnership, that is what's going to make the difference. So on behalf of myself and the entire team, thank you for being in it to win it with us. All right. Then this Thursday, and actually, Celebrate Minnesota is kind of working with us for this. There's a National Day of Prayer. Is there, is there like some prayer needed for our nation? So I, I think there's going to be a great turnout. That's this Thursday, this Thursday at the courthouse outside. And there's going to be worship starting at 1130 and then uh, prayer from noon to one. So if you're able to come to that or part of it. And uh, there are some things that look like this out in the kiosk, some invites if you want to grab that, feel free to. And Pastor Buddy, come and let us know what is going on next Sunday after the service. Praise the Lord, saints. <laughs> okay, Pastor Buddy, yeah. Praise the Lord, saints. Y'all almost there. Praise the Lord, saints. Let me try this. Give God some praise. There, there we go. That's much better, much better. I just got two announcements for you real quick. First announcement is somebody say next Sunday, May 7th, I'm going to bring me some extra dollars and feed my tummy and support our kids. See, the, the funny thing is that the more I say it, the lower it got, actually. So I don't know how many people going to actually. But listen, we're doing a fundraiser for the kids next week for, to go into camp. For those that don't know, hey, man, come on, give it up. The cost is $300 per kid, so we're trying to do fundraisers to subsidize some of that cost because we recognize that some parents are not able to do that, especially if you got multiple kids in your household. So we are asking you to come support us. We're going to, I'm going to get on the grill, y'all. I'm going to show y'all some Kansas City barbecue. All right? Not Chiefs barbecue, but Kansas City barbecue. All right, so I'm going to be on the grill. We're going to have hamburgers, hot dogs, chips, and some kind of a drink, but just bring your money. You can hang out with us, or you can take it to go. We're going to have both options available. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then lastly, uh, May, June 1st, June 1st, or the first Sunday in June, we're going to be rolling out a new check-in system, parents. We're going to be rolling out a new check-in system for checking in uh, children's church and nursery. So we're having a training for all of those volunteers that works in either the nursery, children's church, all ushers, and any other one body else that are leaders, I need you here May 21st, right after service. I'm going to give you a light lunch. We're going to go through it. It'll probably be about an hour. Everybody get a chance to practice it, and then we're going to go home. Amen? So if you are part of any children's ministry, the youth ministry, or an usher, May 21st, please, please, please make presence to be here. If you're not able to make it, please come and see me so that we can teach you the new system at a time that works for you. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. All right. Ushers, you can come. And Steve, why don't you come get ready? Steve's going to share a song with us uh, as the offering is being received. I read last week from Luke 12, 15, where Jesus said, Take heed 
And beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the thing he possesses. So we're to guard against covetousness, which is wanting something we don't have. And it's okay to want stuff. The key is we've got to be willing to be content whether we ever get it or not. And covetousness is when we won't be content unless we get it. And Jesus is reminding us that, that uh, stuff isn't what life is about. It doesn't make us happier. He went on then to tell a story about a farmer who was so prosperous that he decided to tear down all his barns and build bigger barns so he could store up more stuff and selfishly use his stuff. And then this is what Jesus said. God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose those things... Let me read that again. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? In other words, once you die, you leave it all behind for people who might not use it the way you think they should. And then it says, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So it's a good thing to plan for our future and all of those things, but it's also good and even better to be rich towards God and to use our resources generously. So keep that in mind as you receive the offering today. Good morning. So honored to have this opportunity to minister music this morning, and I just pray that God will bless and touch and uplift the hearts of all of you. Our family has been recently coming here as our new home church, and we've just been so blessed by all the friendliness and warmth of, of all of you who have welcomed us. and. And uh, just the presence of God is here in such a special way. So praise the Lord. I'm going to sing a song this morning called The Beautiful Body of Christ. and feet thorns to crown his head body growing weak shallow labored breath real flesh and blood fragile human frame but hell could not defeat the power it contain oh the beautiful body of Christ rising from death into life the glory of God must hide and shallow still resides in the beauty body of Christ sinful worldly hearts full of mortal flaws crying out for help clinging to the cross free of flesh and could not defeat the power we proclaim oh the beautiful body of Christ rising from death into life the glory of God most high still resides in the beautiful body of Christ. One glorious day is coming soon when Jesus is coming back. Amen. When the trumpet sounds all in 
him shall rise called up in the clouds forever glorified death no longer lives life eternal reigns bowing at his throne in everlasting wonderful song. Well, before we get into the word, two more things we're going to do. We're going to do a baby dedication. So I'm going to ask Jonathan and Selena to come. And if any of your family standing with you, they can come. Becky, join me. As they're coming in 1 Samuel 1, Hannah prayed that God would give her a child and said, God, if you give us a child, we'll dedicate that child to you. And so God answered the prayer. And when Samuel was very young, they brought him into the house of the Lord and dedicated him to God. And then when we move into the New Testament, in Luke 2, we see Joseph and Mary doing the same thing, bringing Jesus when he was very young into the house of the Lord and dedicating him to God. Not here yet? Okay, let's, we'll, we'll do the next part and then come back to this, all right? So now you got the introduction to that. The other thing we're doing is we're bringing in some new members to Jubilee. How exciting is that? So uh, I'm going to ask the following people to come forward and any staff or elders available. Uh, why don't you come right up and stand across here so everybody can see you. Emma Ferguson, Lisa Johnson, Judy Menedes, Fred Fielding, Leanne Ebert, Lori Keller, and Brenda Kipling. Now, Lori and Brenda are already members, but when they were taken into membership, they weren't able to be here that Sunday. So I wanted to call them up and have them with uh, the rest of these. But God has just blessed Jubilee with such amazing, amazing people. And membership really is one of those win-win because of two things. If God's leading somebody to a church, here's two things we know. He knows that he, if he's leading them to the church, that church will be a good place for their next uh, growth and ministry and journey. So he wouldn't lead them somewhere that's not going to be, you know, great for them. But also, if he's leading somebody to the church, it means he's going to use their gifts to make that church better, more effective, more fruitful, more loving. So it's a, a win-win. So we celebrate uh, the journey that each of these have been on. Grateful God brought them to our church family. And um, we, we just believe they're going to keep growing and keep being used of God. And uh, that our church, again, is going to be a, a healthier church because of who God has made them to be. So we welcome them. And I'm going to pray uh, and just ask everybody just to join us as we pray. Father, we thank you for these uh, amazing people that you have added to this Jubilee family. We thank you, God, for each one's testimony of what you have been doing in their lives, 
And we thank you, God, that these are people gifted from you, gifted in ways that's going to make our church family even healthier and even uh, more fruitful. And Lord, we pray that, that while each of these are a part of this church family, that this will be a safe place for them, a place, Lord, where they will continue to grow and just develop uh, healthy, strong friendships, and Lord, where they will just continue uh, to grow and that their gifts will continue to flourish and advance the kingdom of God. And so we thank you so much, Lord, for each one of these. And today we just pray your blessings upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't you help me, Becky? We have a certificate for each of you. Give them all a hand. And be sure, be sure that after you uh, greet them and introduce yourself. You may be seated as soon as you get the certificate. All right, give them all a hand again. All right, Jonathan and Selena, come on up. The newest Jubilee member. <laughs> well, as you bring Matthew to dedicate him to the Lord, you guys are signifying a few really important things. First of all, your own faith in Christ. That's really the foundation for a dedication. You're also um, acknowledging, thanksgiving to God for this amazing gift that he has blessed your home with. I mean, think of it, of all the parents in the world God could have picked, he picked you guys. Mm -hmm. How about that? He wants to use you uh, to bring out all that God has planned for him, and we believe God does have a wonderful destiny for him. And also, we believe God's got a call upon his life. He's got a purpose. And as you're dedicating him to the Lord, you're also committing him to whatever plan God has for his life. So, Jonathan and Selena, in view of that and before God and your church family, I want to charge you to raise up Matthew in the way that he should go. May you guys do your best to live examples of, of a Christian life in your home. And as he gets old enough to begin to understand things, that you guys will train him up in the ways of the Lord. Seek to lead him into a personal relationship with Christ. And if you're willing to accept this charge, please answer, we will. We will. All right, I am going to grab some oil here as a symbol of the Holy Spirit and dedicate Matthew to the Lord. And as I do, join with me and pray along with us. Father, we thank you for this precious gift of life. And I now dedicate Matthew Lamar Haft to you, God, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for this precious gift of life. We just pray covering over him, Lord, that he'll be protected, safe all of his days. And, Lord, that he will just, as a, at a very young age, have an understanding of the things of God and give his life to you. May he serve you all of the days of his life. And, Lord, whatever plan, purpose you have for him, we know it will be good. And we just pray that plan into existence in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for Selena this morning, Lord. And, Lord, I thank you that you chose her yes. to be Matthew's mom. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray a blessing over her. I pray that each day she will sense your presence with her, helping her as she is training little Matthew, and that she will know that you are giving her everything she needs. And I pray, Lord, that she will just sense your presence helping her in even some of the difficult situations that might happen when you're raising little kids, that she'll have your godly wisdom in those situations. She'll have your courage within her. And I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed her as Matthew's mom. In your name, Jesus. 
And Lord, I lift up Jonathan and just pray, God, that as he seeks to lead his family, that you will empower him, that you'll give him wisdom and strength all along the way. And God, that he will just be the, the father, the husband, the man of God that you've called him to be. And we thank you that he does have a heart for you and a heart for his family. And I thank you, God, that you are going to give him wisdom to lead his home. We thank you for the supportive family that he has behind him also. And, uh, Lord, we just pray that this home will be a home filled with your peace, your joy, your strength. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, he may not be real happy right now, but I'm going to just pick him up anyway and give you a little closer view of Matthew Lamar. <laughs> We have a certificate uh, of dedication to remind you of uh, in the days ahead of what took place today. And then on behalf of your church family, we have these flowers. Uh, the red carnation is for you, Jonathan, symbolizing the strength and courage of fatherhood. And then the white carnation is, is for you, Selena, representing the purity and sanctity of motherhood. And then the rose that's just starting to open uh, is representative of Matthew's life. And this rose will begin to open up in the next days and, and send forth a sweet fragrance into your home. And that represents Matthew's life. And God's going to use you to bring out uh, all the, the fragrance that God has put in his life and uh, it'll be a beautiful thing in the sight of God. So, on behalf of your church family, we congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you. The children may go ahead and be dismissed for Kids Church. I don't know if Mark was going to say anything about this, but there is someone special here today, and it is his mother. Stand up, Mom. And she is 89 today. <laughs> Happy birthday. We love you. Yes, today. How can I have an 89-year-old mother, right? <laughs> Amen. Well, if you want to follow along with me in your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Ephesians and chapter 4. Recently, starting Easter, actually, I did a two-part series on the theme, Sons of God Manifest from Romans 8. And in that message, we saw that the world is actually longing for Christians to actually live like Christians, and they want to see what real Christians look like. Now, they don't know that's what they're longing for, but that's what Romans 8 tells us that they are longing for. And I believe it's time we give the world what they need to see. And Ephesians 4, 12 to 16, gives us another glimpse of what a mature people of God look like. Now, there's a few things I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through this passage. First of all, as we look at what a mature people of God look like, I want you to kind of do a little bit of a check to see where are you at personally in comparison to what we're looking at. Now, there'll probably be a gap between us and where we can be, but don't let that discourage you. Instead, let it encourage you to know that's what God has for you, and God will empower you to get there if you will follow his process. The other thing I want you to keep in mind as we go through this is that this is not just about you and I individually. It's about us as a church family. Ephesians is not addressed to individual Christians. It's addressed to the church. It's addressed to a group of believers who are in relationship together. So the second thing we want to look at is, uh, is this what we're looking at? Is this what the church looks like today? And again, if it does not, let that not discourage us, but rather let it encourage us to know God has more for his church. And, and let's, let's catch the vision of what God has, and then let's go there. And what we'll look at more toward the end is how do we get there? What's the process? What, what means did God give us to be able to get there? And we won't get through all of this today, but we'll just pick up next Sunday wherever we 
left off. So let's go to Ephesians 4. I'm going to begin with verse 12. I'm reading out of the New King James. It says, For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. There's two parts here that we're going to look at, and I'm going to give you a total of probably about nine characteristics of what a mature church looks like. But here we see the first one is the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Now, don't let that word saints throw you. Some of you came from a background where a saint meant a super Christian that hardly anybody ever attains to. But from a biblical standpoint, every one of us are called to be saints. All a saint means is a holy person. And God says, without holiness, no one can see God. God said, be holy as I am holy. So all of us are called to be saints. We're all called to be living holy lives. So that's the first thing I want you to notice is we're all called to live that way, and God empowers us to be able to do that. But notice also, every one of us are called to be equipped to do the work of ministry. Did you notice the word work? there. Ministry is work, okay? You, you didn't know that, right? Ministry is work. It's work. It's work. Now, don't let the word ministry throw you. Some of you might think, well, but, but I'm not called to preach behind a pulpit. Well, you don't have to use a pulpit. You can use a music stand. No, I'm just kidding, because you know what the word ministry means? It means serving, serving, so you are called to be equipped to use the gifts God's given you to serve the body of Christ. So start envisioning that. What would a church look like if every single person were, were, was pursuing a righteous, holy life, and every one of them were equipped to use their gifts to serve the body and to serve in the marketplace? What would a church like that look like? How impactful would it be? And many of you are like, well, I'm already doing that, and that's wonderful, but maybe some of you have not yet found that place. Now, notice the last part of that verse, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the second characteristic of a mature church is it is edified, which means strengthened. If it's strengthened, it means it's strong. If we were to jump ahead into the sixth chapter, it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So every one of us, we are called to be strengthened so that we are strong. Doesn't mean we never have challenges or questions or go through situations, but it means overall we and we together are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So the saints are equipped to do the work of ministry. The saints are... I think I'm stuck a little bit there. The body of Christ is built up and therefore strong. Let's go to verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. So this is number three. The body of Christ is walking in the unity of the faith. So first of all, notice that a mature church is a church that walks in unity. Unity. Now that doesn't mean we just are sort of nice to each other. Yeah, we, that should be a part of it. But notice what the unity is based on, our faith, our common faith. Now, it doesn't mean we're all going to believe exactly the same thing on every little point, but it means overall the thing that unites us is our common faith and that there is a strong unity because of that common faith that we pursue together. And then it also says, till we come to the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. So our unity is based on our common faith. Our unity is based on our knowledge of the Son of God. That does not mean simply the facts from Scripture about Jesus. It includes that. But it means our experiencing Jesus together. So as, as we are worshiping God, as we are in community together and, and walking out our faith together, we experience Jesus together. And experiencing Jesus together 
is that unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Again, an experiential knowledge, not only a knowledge of certain facts about Jesus. And then it says, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Perfect there does not mean no weaknesses. It simply means mature, mature. So God's calling the church to be mature, and notice what it says there, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we're to walk in the unity of the faith. We're to walk in the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. And then that leads us to, let me back up there. That leads us to being mature and manifesting more of the fullness of Christ. Remember, that's what the world needs to see. They need to see the people of God looking like Jesus. They need to see the people of God manifesting the fullness of Christ. And God makes all of that possible for us. Let's go on to verse 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. In other words, we're called to be stable. Stable. Think about children. Children are vulnerable because they're young. They're not mature yet. They don't have a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom, a lot of discernment. They're vulnerable. Children tend to believe just about anything you tell them. That's part of why the Bible says we should become like children in terms of being trusting in a simple way before God. But if you tell a child something that child is likely going to be so trusting that that child will likely believe it whether it's true or not. And if somebody else comes along a little while later and tells the child something completely different, the child might, oh, okay, and believe that. Because, again, immature, vulnerable, lack of discernment, so they can be tossed to and fro regarding what they believe. And we're not, as we mature, we're not supposed to be that way. We are supposed to be stable because out there, there are all kinds of things that are not true that you and I are being bombarded with. And if we are not mature, if we are not stable, if we are not grounded in the truth, we will be deceived. Now, how do we become stable? We become stable by staying connected with the church family so that there is accountability. But the most important thing is we become stable by saturating ourselves in the truths of God's Word. If you are not grounded in the truths of God's Word, then you will be more easily deceived. But when you continue to immerse yourself in the truth of God's Word, then what happens when you get exposed to something that's not true, your spirit, like there's something wrong with that. There's like a yellow or a red light that comes in your spirit. And I'll add one more thing. We need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, be full of the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit that can give you and I discernment when it comes to truth. It says, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. There's a lot of that going on in our world today. There are those out there trying to trick you and I, trying to trick the church. There's a lot of cunning craftiness, deceitful plotting, trying to get you and I to buy into ungodly narratives, but we will not be deceived. We will not be tossed to and fro. We will stand in the truth. So, as we mature, we become stable, we're not easily deceived. Let's go to verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. Speaking the truth in love. You can't speak the truth if you don't know the truth. 
So, first of all, we've got to know the truth, which is what we just talked about. But there's a second qualification to speaking the truth. First, you have to know the truth, but there's a second qualification, and that is you have to speak the truth in what? In love. love. There's a lot of people today trying to speak the truth, but forgetting the love part of it. Do you know what happens when we speak the truth without love? Typically what happens is we come across to people as legalistic and judgmental, and instead of that attracting them to the truth, it will probably drive them further away from the truth. If you're not going to speak the truth in love, you're probably better off to not speak the truth at all because you're just going to drive people further away from the truth. Now, on the other hand, some people, they are all about love, but leave the truth out of it. When you pursue walking in love, but you leave the truth out of it, then what happens is you promote moral compromise, and the result is the people that you're associating with, they're probably going to stay stuck in life, not able to move ahead, because it's when you know the truth that you're set free. So if we give them love but no truth, they're probably going to stay stuck in moral compromise and not be able to move forward with their lives. And then it says that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Grow up into him. I think sometimes in our Western way of thinking, growth simply means we know more facts. I can quote more scriptures. And there's a There's a place for obviously knowing and quoting more scriptures, but I want you to notice the growth that we just read about. It says we grow up into him, into Christ the head. If Christ is the head, it means he's the control center of our lives, and we follow his lead. We're we're not the ones in control. He is, and we're growing up into him. And, And I believe that what that's really talking about is learning to abide in Christ. And I want to read what Jesus said about that in John 15, 5. We have two evidences that we are abiding in Christ here. He says, and he who abides in me and I in him, so we abide in him, he abides in us, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. What is this fruit we bear? Galatians 5, 22 and 23, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, Goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. So if you are abiding in Christ, then those are the fruits that you should be growing. And by the way, when, when you are under pressure, do you know what comes out of you? Whatever's in you. Whatever's in you. So if you're like under all kinds of pressure, and you're abiding in Christ, and Christ is abiding in you, then all that should come out is all the fruit of the Spirit that's in you. And if that's not what's coming out, then we need to grow up. But then there's a second thing he says here, verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. So, First evidence we're abiding in Christ is the fruit of the Spirit. We're being more like Jesus. The second fruit is our prayers generally are getting answered. Why are they getting answered? Because we're abiding in Him, and He's abiding in, our, in us. As we're abiding in His Word. His Word's abiding in us. And that means the things we're praying are a result of our abiding in Christ. So we're not trying to talk God into doing something that isn't his will. The very thing in us is his will, and therefore we see answers to prayer. All right, let's go to verse 16, and this is the last verse in this section. And this is sort of how it all comes together. It says, from whom the whole body, Steve sang about that in that amazing song, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. You are not called to live the Christian life independently. You are not called to, some people, oh, just me and Jesus. 
That, that doesn't work. Think about it. Who is Jesus? He's the head. Who are you? You're a member. A body is not the head and one member. Even if, even if you're the mouth of the body. A head and a mouth. It takes more than that to have a body. So no, it's not just you and Jesus. It's, it's his body. You know, not, not just you as one member. So we got to be connected. It says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. Catch this. By what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which each part does its share. That goes back to where we began. Equipped to do the work of ministry. So what happens is when you are using your gifts to serve, what, what happens is wherever you're connected or serving, you are actually bringing a supply to that connection. You are bringing life. You are actually bringing the grace of God. Imagine what that looks like when we're all doing our thing in, in wherever we're connected and we're all just giving out the grace of God because all our gifts come by his grace and it's feeding, it's nourishing, it's strengthening the body. So in the end it says it causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You know, when the body's functioning properly, it, it just kind of grows itself. It becomes stronger. It becomes more Christ-like. It becomes more impactful. So that's, that's what the body is supposed to be doing. Now, I want to just a real quick sneak ahead to chapter 5, verse 27. There it is. That he, that's Jesus, might present her to himself. The her is the church, the body of Christ. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's the church he's coming back for. Now, there's you know, all kinds of ideas as to when he's going to come. I sometimes wonder this. Could it be... What, you know, when, when we talk about the return of Christ, sometimes people look at it like it's already on God's calendar, and now it's just if we figure it out or not. Could it be... The return of Christ is fluid instead of static. In other words, could it be, it's not about a date on the calendar. <clears throat> it's about the church just doing what it's supposed to do. Could it be the Lord saying, I'm ready. I just, I just got to get my church to be ready. And as soon as the church is ready, I'll, I'll come. Could it be up to us? Could it be we've not yet become that glorious church without spot or wrinkle? And as soon as we do, he'll say, I've been waiting to come and get you. Now that brings us to this question, as amazing as everything is we just looked at, how do we get there? How do we get there? What's the process? What does God use to bring us from where, wherever we are to that place? Well, we started with verse 12, so let's go back to verse 11 and look for the answer. It may surprise you. But here's the answer. And he, Jesus himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, and here's where we started, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. In other words, God's means of producing everything that we just read is by giving gifts to the church of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Now, let me just talk a little bit about this. There's been a lot of misunderstanding as to what these gifts are and how they function. And all of us come from, you know, all different kinds of backgrounds. So some of you have been exposed to teachings on these. Others are like, I haven't really heard a whole lot about it. So there's a number of things I want to mention here. First of all, Often, this is referred to as five-fold ministry. So some of you are, will be familiar with that terminology. Some refer to these as the five office gifts, even though the word office is not in there. I prefer to use the term five functional gifts to the church, five functional gifts. I think it more accurately describes their calling. In some circles... These five gifts have been so, like, put on a pedestal 
that the average Christian who isn't called to one of those five, they sort of see themselves as, well, these people are way up here, and the rest of us are just down here. And the way that that comes across is that because these people up here are so gifted and you're not, your job is just to serve them, help them to look good, and that's the game. In other words, the, the, that mindset is basically that if you're not called to that level, then you are called to serve those who are called to that level. And I want to say to you, the truth is almost inverse of that. I'll say it this way. These five gifts are not called to be served by the saints. They're called to serve the saints. In the verses I read, verses 12 through 16, it didn't talk about any of those gifts, did it? It just talked about the saints. In other words, the focus here <clears throat> isn't the gifts. The focus is how those gifts affect the saints. They're not even mentioned again because the focus is the saints. These gifts exist. To do what? They exist not to do all the ministry while the rest of us cheer them on and, and, you know, watch them out doing their thing. No, it says they exist for the purposes of equipping the rest of the body to do the work and to help bring the rest of the body to maturity. Yeah. Let, me, let me give this analogy. I know there's a few people here who like, you know, the foot, football, NFL, and so, and I do, I like watching football. But here's the thing when you think about it. I don't watch football to focus on the coaches. The coaches aren't on the field. They're on the sidelines. The only person watching football for the coach is the coach's mother. Maybe the brother, but if it's the brother, it's to criticize the coach for how they're coaching the game. <laughs> Think about it. In a three-hour game, how much focus does the coach get? Oh, once in a while, the camera shows or maybe a comment about a decision. The, the game is not about the coach. It's about the players on the field. <laughs> the players on the field are not the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. They're the coaches on the sideline. You are the players in the game on the field. Now, notice all five of these functional gifts are needed if the church is going to be fully equipped and fully mature. In much of the church world today, they believe that, well, we still got pastors, we still have evangelists, we still have teachers, but, but God took away the apostles and prophets, so we don't have them anymore. Well, if God gave all five of these to fully equip the church for the work of ministry and to bring the saints to full maturity, if we don't have all five, Here's what I can tell you. It's impossible for the church to be fully equipped for ministry and to be fully mature. Could it be that's why the church today doesn't look all that much like the church in Acts did because we have not accepted all five functional gifts as necessary for the church today. Now, we read, verse 11, Jesus gave these two the church. So, if Jesus gave them to the church, show me where it says he changed his mind and took them back. I can't find any verse where it says he took them away from the church or that he ever would take them away from the church. Now, there's kind of a flip-flop of that. So, you know, when the apostolic and prophetic uh, teaching started flourishing and, and all of that. Some churches, they almost did the reverse of that. 
And they ended up almost like apostle and prophet were the only gifts. Almost like what happened to the pastor, evangelist, and teacher? Where did they go? I'm not a math major, but to me, if you go from three to two, that's not progress, right? Let me give you just a couple of illustrations that may help kind of tie this together. Think of these five functional gifts as five spiritual food groups needed for the church. So if you and I are going to be all that God wants us to be, if we're going to be as spiritually healthy as we can, we need a balance of all five of these spiritual food groups. Let me say it another way. Think of the church as having an engine and it being a five-cylinder engine. If the church is meant to run on a five-cylinder engine and it's only running on two or three cylinders, it might move, but it's not going to be efficient, fast, or powerful. So the church needs <clears throat> to be functioning on all five cylinders. Now, a couple questions, and then I'm going to bring it in for a landing about here. But what are these five functional gifts? And we're going to find out that, again, there's been a lot of misunderstanding as what they actually are. So we'll start next week looking at, well, what are they? Secondly, how are they to relate to one another? And I'll give you a little hint. It's not a hierarchy. It's not the apostles, they're in charge, then the prophet, then, no, it's linked arm in arm. It's not a hierarchy, okay? So how are they to relate to each other? How are they to be related to the church? Personally, if one of those gifts is disconnected from the church, I don't really want a whole lot to do with them because they're supposed to be there for the church, strengthening the church. And then the question that perhaps is most relevant to you and I, if I am not called <clears throat> to one of those five functional gifts, then, then what does it have to do with me? And what you're going to find out is it has everything to do with you because they exist for you. Amen. They exist to train and equip you. They exist to mature you. So then it brings the question, how does that work? How do we relate to these gifts in a way that causes you and I to grow, to mature, to be fully equipped? So those are some of the things we're going to be talking about uh, next week. And it's going to take more than that, but there'll be some breaks because of Mother's Day and a couple of other things, but I'm going to ask you to stand with me. What does a mature people of God look like? Of all the things we talked about, let me highlight the two. First of all, it means we are all fully equipped to use our gifts in a way that bears fruit in a way that strengthens the body, and in a way that touches the people out there in the marketplace. And then secondly, it's to help you and I grow so that we are stable. We are walking in unity. We are manifesting more and more of the fullness of Christ. That's what God has for us. And I'll close with this scripture again. He's coming back for a church, glorious church, a holy church. That's his call. That's his call. That's what the world needs to see. Let's give the world what they need to see. Let's press in and, and let God make us that glorious people. And I want to remind you, we're, we're not this alone. We're this together. We're this together. Think about the members of your body. As amazing as they all are, they all have to be connected. They all have to be functioning 
together. That's when the human body has just such amazing potential. But as important as any one of our members are, if we separate it from the body, it no longer can continue to function. Well, let's pray. And as we pray, I'm going to ask any prayer teams serving today. By the way, the the word Joseph brought earlier, I think, really ties in with this message because we're going to have to be strong if persecution is going to increase. We're going to have to be connected if persecution is, is going to come. And so all of this helps us be strong in no matter what kind of things we're going to face. So any prayer team serving today, you come. And after I close in prayer, you're welcome to go. But if you want prayer today, we'll have a team or two up here that would be happy to pray with you. And if there's anybody here like, I don't know if I'm right with God. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I have eternal life. Well, if that's you, let one of the prayer teams know. They would, they would love to just encourage you, help you, and pray with you. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the calling that you have upon the church. And we thank you, God, that we can be that glorious church, radiating your glory to a world starving to see your glory, your presence, what real Christians look like and live like. And I pray, God, that these verses, even though we may not fully understand them, I thank you that they call us to a higher calling, a higher calling. And we thank you, God, that everything we need to get there is available to us. I thank you, God, that in this place today are saints gifted by you. Many know their gifting. Many are walking out their callings or giftings. Others may not really know yet where, where they fit, but I thank you that you have a place. You have a gifting, and I pray that in the days ahead, you will show each one where they fit in the body. And I just thank you, God, for such uh, an amazing church family of gifted, loving people. And Lord, may we continue to live out the unity of the faith and the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Lord, keep growing us up. Keep growing us up. God, that we will be able to be used by you in the challenging days in which we live, that we will truly be salt and light even in a world full of darkness oh i thank you lord the darker it is the more the light can be seen and the greater the distinction between light and darkness lord help us to be bold and courageous but lord help us also never forget to walk in love to walk in love oh lord let that fruit of love god just emanate from our lives And I just speak a blessing over each one here today, each household as we go our ways. Use us this week, God, in our homes, our neighborhoods, our schools, our workplaces, the marketplace. Use us for your glory. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you go, I speak over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Come if you'd like prayer before you go.